Hi everyone, it's Kathleen Hemrick. I am back with chapter four of Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. I feel like I'm on a roll. I just finished another chapter last night, so let's proceed forward. This chapter is about the progression of recovery. Signs of recovery. Effective recovery work leads to an ongoing reduction of emotional flashbacks. Over time, with enough practice, you become more proficient at managing triggered states. This in turn results in flashbacks occurring less often, less intensely, and less enduringly. That sounds good. Another key sign of recovering is that your critic begins to shrink, I like that, and lose its dominance over your psyche. As it shrinks, your user-friendly ego has room to grow and to develop the kind of mindfulness that recognizes when the critic has taken over. That's pretty empowering. This in turn allows you to progressively reject the critic's perfectionistic and drasticizing processes. I call it catastrophizing, but he says drasticizing. More and more, you stop per persecuting yourself for normal foibles. Foibles meaning like mistakes. He has big words. Additionally, you perseverate less in disappointment about other people's minor miscues. Perseverate means to think too much on. Kind of wish he would just say that though. <laughs> um, that's just me though. Okay. I also highlighted an alternative way of describing this decrease in overreacting is that you have a good balance between the polar opposites of fight and fawn. Now everybody knows what fight is, but remember fawn is when you kind of just people please. As this becomes increasingly realized, you vacillate healthily between asserting your own needs and compromising with the needs of others. Okay, I just want to point out something. I am not trying to be patronizing, but my mom was an English teacher and some of these words, I'm just like, really? It's like, it's a bit much. So vacillating, in case you don't know, it means going back and forth. And for all those that know and find me patronizing, I'm sorry. A further example of decreased reactivity is seen in a more balanced movement between the polar opposites of fight and freeze. This manifests as an improving equilibrium between doing and being, between sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system arousal, and between left and right brain processing. The importance of balancing for the importance of balancing the fight slash fawn and flight slash freeze polarities within yourself is explored in greater detail in another chapter. All right, then he goes on to say, gosh, just gets a lot here. All right, then I went on to surviving versus thriving. Hey, that's the title of the book. It's probably pretty important, huh? I'm a little, I'm a little quippy today. Quippy, I don't even know if that's the right word. I'm punny. Okay, surviving versus thriving. Recovery involves learning to handle unpredictable shifts in our inner emotional weather. Perhaps the ultimate dimension of this is what I call the surviving, thriving continuum. Before we enter into recovery, it's kind of interesting that he calls it recovery, um, almost like our trauma is akin to addiction, um, which kind of makes sense to me, like we continue to do things that hurt ourselves despite the negative consequences, because that's how we were raised, right? We were raised being hurt, so we either hurt ourselves or hurt others or both. All right. Before we enter into recovery, it may feel like life is nothing but a struggle to survive. A lot of my clients feel that way. However, when recovery progresses enough, we begin to have some experience of feeling like we are thriving. These may start out as feelings of optimism, hopefulness, and certainty that we are indeed recovering. And then the bottom inevitably drops out because recovery is never all an all forward progress. That's true, it's not linear. It goes back and forth like almost anything else. Oh, so unfairly, we are back to feeling that we can barely survive. To make matters worse, we are amnesiac that we even had a respite from surviving. Again, the big words, amnesiac, I just, I think you could simplify some things, Pete. 
another flashback has hit and we are and we polarize back onto the surviving end of the continuum. We are stuck in the anxious and deadened feelings of the abandonment melange. In survival mode, even the most trivial and normally easy tasks can feel excruciatingly difficult. Agreed. As in childhood, it is all it it is all feels just Actually, that's an error. It all feels just too hard. And if the flashback is especially intense, the nat the natos may start knocking down the door. The natos or the natos is the death urge described by Freud. And in a flashback, it, it, it corresponds with a suicidal ideation we looked at in chapter one. I don't remember that part, but okay. <sighs> Let's see. Oh, I underlined this part. Temptations can be great at such times to revert to the less functional ways of self-soothing that we learned when we were younger. Depending upon your 4F type, remember fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, this commonly manifests as increased eating, substance abuse, working, sleeping or not sleeping well, and or sexually acting out. And then under the title of difficulties in identifying the signs of recovery, I highlighted this. If we do not notice the degrees of our own improvement in our recovery work, we are in great danger of giving up on recovering. Because of black and white thinking, we can regularly fall into the trap of not acknowledging and valuing what we are actually accomplishing. Perfectionistic dismissal of improvement that is not 100% is common in early recovery. I love that. A lot of my clients don't realize it, but they they have this either black and white thinking or this perfectionist thinking or both because they kind of piggyback off of each other. And I always tell them that it's not about being perfect. Nobody is perfect. It's about being present, being authentic, being in your body and out of your inner critic. Out of your inner critic. Could be a good title for a book. All right. I might want to write a book one of these days. All right, I also underlined under accepting recovery as a lifelong process. Oh, I don't like that. Okay, so what, what, all right, Pete, tell us why we have to accept recovery as a lifelong process, really? It is exceedingly difficult to accept the proposition, the fact, that recovery is never complete. And although we can expect our flashbacks to markedly decrease over time, it is tremendously difficult and sometimes impossible to let go of the salvation fantasy that we will one day be free forever of them. Yet, when we do not loosen our grip on the salvation fantasy, we remain extremely susceptible to blaming ourselves every time we have a flashback. I guess salvation fantasy, I think he talks about further, I mean, earlier in the book is like, Something miraculously is going to happen that is going to completely take away all your painful memories, like uh, like an emotional lobotomy, and that that's not good. Anyway, we, we really don't want to take away our memories. We want to neutralize them, and that's when you might want to start looking up EMDR, Eye Movement Desensitization Reprocessing. Try to say that three times fast. Then he continues to write, Moreover, most recoveries often have the unfortunate subjective experience that the temporary regression feels as, a perm feels as permanent as concrete. This is especially true because of the interminability feeling of flashbacks. I don't know what that word is, interminability feeling of flash flashbacks. Interminability. Help me out here, people. When we flash back, we regress to our, our child mind, which was incapable of imagining a future any different than the everlasting present of being so abandoned. That's so sad and so true. Let me repeat that. When we flash back, we regress to our child mind, which was incapable of imagining a future any different than the everlasting present of being so abandoned. That is so sad. That's what keeps us trapped. Right? That's why we have to do inner child work to free that child, let them know they're safe. Recovering from overwhelming, 
Overwhelmingly painful childhoods is also so difficult because we understandably want to avoid any further pain at all. Hell yeah, hello, yeah. Hey, hey, I have a lot of pain. Oh, let me give you more. Oh, yay. No, no, we don't want more pain. We may even believe that we need to risk a flashback and, and practice speaking up. Let me repeat that. We may even believe that we need to risk a flashback and practice speaking up. But at the moment of facing the triggering, that silence can so easily avoid. We cannot sometimes help giving up and remaining mute. Ah, so talk up, speak up, act up when that flashback happens. However, if we are ever to recover our real voice, we must sometimes invoke the energy of bravery. Now sometimes, I mean like a lot of times. Bravery is, in my opinion, defined by fear. It is taking right action despite being afraid. Totally agree with that one. It's not about being fearless. It's about doing things despite the fear. It is not brave to do things that are not scary. Moreover, when we embrace this practice, we will eventually learn that fear does not have to be disabling. We can be afraid and still act powerfully. I love that. I love that. I like it because I, I'm like, yeah. Because I often do things when I'm scared and it makes it even more sweet when I've done something and I've been scared. It's like more rewarding. Yeah, yeah. We can refuse to tolerate never speaking up, never having our say, never stating a preference, and never saying no to set a boundary. No. Ooh, underline this whole paragraph. All right, get ready, people. As our recovery progresses, we need to learn to endure these feelings. Reinterpreting the deeper meaning of these feelings is key to accomplishing this. Typically, this involves epiphanies like the following. I feel afraid now, but I am not in danger like I was as a child. I feel guilty, not because I am guilty, but because I was intimidated into feeling guilty for expressing my opinions, my needs, and my preferences. Bam. I feel shame because my parents reigned disgust on me for being me. I say no to these toxic parental curses, and I am proud and right to see how they tried to murder my soul. Damn, he's gotten really deep here. Intense. I'm not sign PDs. I give them their shame back as disgust, the disgust any healthy adult feels when he sees a parent bullying a child with contempt, or when he sees a parent heartlessly ignoring a suffering child. You can tell Pete has had his own share of pain. I mean, that's a given. That's one of the reasons why he wrote the book because he had, uh, you probably all know this, but he had um, pretty bad like um, emotional CPTSD with a little bit of physical from his father. Then under the title of Silver Linings. The silver lining in this, however, is that many of us were forced to consciously address our suffering because our wounding was so much more severe. Those who work an effective recovery program not only recover significantly from emotional damage, but also evolve out of the emotional impoverishment of the general society. Wow, emotional impoverishment of the general society. What's he saying about the general society there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, gotta agree. One of my clients described this as becoming way more emotionally intelligent than the normies. Ah, that's funny. All right, I move forward to another paragraph that says, finally, another silver, li silver lining often achieved in later stage recovery is a greater ability to handle normal pain in the most healthy and least re-traumatizing way. By normal pain, I mean the recurring existential pain all human beings experience from time to time via encounters with loss, illness, money troubles, time pressures, etc. Such painful encounters can produce Emotional reactions like anger, sadness, fear, and depression. The average person has not learned how to verbally ventilate and metabolize their feelings about such events. This results in them getting stuck in painful emotional places, especially depression, for inordinate amounts of time. So it's kind of like, even though we feel like we've been cursed, which we kind of have, I think, with CPTSD, what happens is that 
if we recover, if we build up that resiliency and we start to really allow ourselves to feel our emotions, we actually um, become better than the average person at dealing with anxiety and depression because we're so in tune with how we're feeling. We're not repressing it and hiding it. So it can become like a superpower. I also underlined much of the general populace, however, becomes increasingly disassociated from their full emotional experience by anxiously pushing to pump up their mood. Many normal people strive to fulfill the pursuit of happiness as if it were a patriotic duty. More and more, they employ socially acceptable addictions. I love that, socially acceptable addictions to accomplish this. Snacking, spending, self-medicating, and online puttering are widespread addictions that seem to be ever on the rise. Oh yes, because this was written in uh, 2013, remember? So it's, it's even more prominent now online. Online anything. Oh, we're almost at the end. Okay, where am I at? Oh, it's going to be a shorter one. So last couple of paragraphs. As a concluding comment to this overview, it is important to emphasize that, like most things in life, there are degrees of CPTSD. The continuum of CPTSD ranges from mild neurosis to psychosis and from highly functioning to non-functioning. Its severity ranges from having extended periods without flashbacks to being in full flashback horror much of the time. This range also varies from a condition of increased experience experiences of thriving to a condition of barely surviving like disability. Last but not least, as we end this overview, we are ready to move to the next chapter, which explains how varying childhood trauma histories can cause CPTSD. Here, we will also see how verbal and emotional abuse alone can cause CPTSD and how profound emotional abandonment is typically at the core of most CPTSD. Let me repeat that. And how profound emotional abandonment is typically at the core of most CPTSD. Wow. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like a Minnesotan there. All right. Thanks for listening, guys. I think this was a good chapter. I think all of his chapters are good. Again, if you want the book, Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. I bought it on Amazon. It has 13 chapters. Next chapter is going to be chapter five, and I will be doing all the chapters, but not necessarily in order. I mean, not, not necessarily one after the other, because I might have life happen, and I might want to make a video about what I'm currently wanting to share. All right, thank you so much. Namaste, and take care.